Hey everyone, Daniel here from Voice Flow. In this video, we're gonna walk through how to create and debug a function. We're also gonna walk through some of the main parts of a function, like mapping variables, handling fetch requests, handling errors, and then actually rendering steps in Voice Flow. So this tutorial assumes that you have a basic understanding of JavaScript because functions is a feature that lets you use JavaScript to be able to do powerful things like manipulate data, send information to and from other services like Zendesk, or segment or your data warehouse and allows you to build a much more powerful assistant. So the first thing we want to do is get a template function. So to make this a bit easier, if you go to voiceflow.com slash functions, you'll see that there is a one called temp called function template. You're going to want to grab that, just download the function. And when you've got it, go head over to your voiceflow project and let's import it. So in voiceflow, if you go to the CMS tab here under functions, you can go ahead and import a function. When you do, it'll look a bit like this. And once you hit import, it'll be able to drop it into your functions workspace. So here's what I'm going to use for this demo. And let's actually just walk through some of the main parts and then I'll show you what it looks like on the canvas and how this comes together. So a couple parts of your function are one is importing the actual variables. And so within a function, you input variables that you use within the function and then you output ones that are valuable. So this is where you input the variables. The second thing I mentioned is the output. And so there's a couple times where we actually return some sort of outputs, but this is the actual ultimate output return for this function where I take, I actually define an output variable. So ID is ticket ID, and then we will actually return that value here so I can map it to a variable within my project. You can also choose paths to go down. And so you can see here I've got an error or a success path. And so based on what's happening in the function, I can determine which path to go down. And then the most powerful part is a trace type. So voice flow supports a number of different trace types. So this might be text, button, carousel that allow you to actually render a message within voice flow without actually needing to actually add a step to the campus. So this allows you to do things like create dynamic carousels from a product list or create a dynamic set of buttons from a table, whatever it might be. This is what you can do with the trace type. So it's very powerful. Now, Throughout this function, I'm doing a bunch of stuff. So I'm making API calls and doing if conditions, but really the most important thing I'm doing here is error handling. And so we're going to spend a bunch of time in this tutorial going through each of these parts and talking about how and why we decide to handle certain errors to give you a sense of how you can build with the voice flow. One important note as well is that functions today is pretty limited when it comes to supporting web browser based functions or external libraries. So you can read about the limitations on our help documentation here, but just think about this as vanilla JavaScript, no external libraries or functions for now, and we'll be adding stuff over time. Now on the actual canvas, and so you can see here that this is a template of what would be a Zendesk ticket flow. So on the canvas, what this looks like is if I go ahead to a flow like submit Zendesk ticket here, I can go to devs, the dev block section, drag out functions and select the function I want to use. So in this case, I'd want to use my demo function here. And you can see that within this function, I have the option to map these input variables. So what this allows us to do is determine, take variables that are in the project and actually import them into my function. And so, for example, the body might be the last utterance. So this is the last thing that a user said. I might have a manual API key here. Subject might be test. And then maybe customer email, some of the other stuff. So let's just fill some of these out and then see what this looks like. Now you can see in my output variable as well, I can map that to an output in voice flow. So in this case, I would want to map it to Zendesk ticket ID. So now when a user hits this block, it's going to take these values, whether that's a variable that's being dynamically filled or something hard coded, and it's going to execute the JavaScript in the function itself. So let's go over the function line by line and see what's going on. So the first line of the function is hard coded. So you can't actually change this. This is just allowing the function to execute in the voice flow runtime code. What's important here is that it's pulling in this variable called args, and this contains a bunch of information, but one of the big ones you're going to use is the input variables. This is where the input variables that you've mapped actually come to. So the first line, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we actually declare all the variables that we're going to use within this function, and they should be the same name as the input variables here, because when you actually put in the values, that's what's going to carry over and map. So if I wanted to add a new input variable called priority, for example, then I'd add it in my input variable section and just make sure that it's declared right on the top here. Now, the second part is where we get into making some of those path and the actual like rendering the trace type. So really powerful stuff. 
So I've got a bunch of different variables here, but I want to make sure that, you know, three of them are actually required. And this is what's needed to make the API call. So the Zendesk key, the body, and the customer email. So what this is doing is this is just doing a simple if condition check to see if these variables are actually, do actually have values. And if it's true, uh, then they all have values. It's just going to skip this. It's going to go to the next part. If not, then it'll execute this return. And so you can see here that in my return, I have two things. One of them is a path. So I'm using the syntax next and path colon, whatever my path name is. So you can see here, I've got an error path. And what this is going to do is it's going to actually force the function to end and it's going to go down the error path. Now, what's also helpful is that in this same step, I'm using the syntax trace to execute a trace type in voice flow. So this is, again, an item you're actually going to render in voice flow. And the one I'm rendering is a debug message. So if you remember in voice flow and you can see it says missing required input variables, like if I go over to the canvas here to where I dragged up this function and I actually hit run, you'll see that the Zendesk API key was missing. And here in voice flow, it gives me a debug message, missing required input variable for this function. And it would have gone down the error path if I actually had something here. So let's just try that out. So you can see it took the error path and it gave me the debug message. So that allows us to debug things easier in voice flow. And if you want to see a list of all the supported trace types, just hit that question mark. You'll take to our documentation. And in supported traces at so the bottom, you'll see all the different trace types that are available that you can use. Now we're adding more over time, but today these are the ones that are supported. So that's how I've executed both a path and a trace type. And we're going to use this all throughout this flow. So this is the easiest way to do kind of debug is you're going to send debug messages into the voice little console, and that's going to allow a user to understand what's going on. So in this case, it was clear that it was missing an input variable. Now the remainder of this is pretty simple JavaScript. So you can see here, I'm just actually preparing to make my fetch request, my API call. And so I'm just packaging up the actual API body, the URL and then the configuration. And then here's where I actually make the fetch request. So I'm using a try catch block. It's just a lot easier for me to be able to go through and log errors because the pattern that I'm doing is I'm just making a check. And if my if condition isn't right, I'm throwing an error and I'm handling all my errors down here in the exact same way that I did the one at the top. So you can see here, it makes the fetch request. And then if it says, if the response is okay, we're gonna move forward. If not, then throw new error. And this is the message. So HTTP error status is whatever the API response status is. And that's actually going to trigger this catch request or trigger the catch. And it's go down, we're going to go down the return function, which is the same one I have at the top. So it's going to take the error path and then the trace type is going to be a debug, but it's actually going to include the error message that I've included here. So HTTP error status 401 or whatever it might be. So. This makes it really easy to actually catch and handle errors. So this is what I would recommend as you're going through it as well. So to walk you through the rest of this, I'm using try catch again for the error handling. And you can see here that I'm using await. And it's important to know that the a function itself is an async, async function. So you can use await instead of Axios. Again, the voice of functions today don't include supporting for external libraries. They will in the future, but not today. And so I can just use await to make sure that this fetch request happens first before the rest of this code executes. Then I'm going to go and just do a quick check to see if the API calls okay. If not, throw that error I was talking about. If that's fine, we're going to go down to the next part here and we're going to parse out the response body. So the API response into a variable called response body. Now, really important here is that functions use a different syntax. And so rather than JSON with parentheses, you just leave out the parentheses. So it's response.json and that will work as expected. So you see documentation for details. There's a bunch of kind of weird syntax things with functions that are important to know. Um, we're going to be making improvements to this over time. This is just for the V1 to be able to get started. Next up, I've got another error handling block here, just making the response body actually has something in it and that it's not empty. So if you do have an empty API, you may want to remove this. And then finally here, I am just taking out one piece of the response body. So the ID and I'm assigning it to a ticket ID variable. Now. Assuming we've gotten through all of these checks, this is where I want to make the actual success return. So in this return, you can see I'm doing next and trace. So next, the path is success. And then the trace type is a text step actually this time. And so if this is successful, it'll actually say in voice low ticket successfully created with ID is like one, two, three, four. And the other thing that's new is output fares. Now, 
Voice allows you to create output variables that you saw on the canvas that I can now map to other parts of my project. And so in this case, I have an output variable called ID. And so I'm just assigning that ID output variable to the ticket ID that I grabbed earlier. So basically that's how voice level functions work. Now let's go ahead and actually test out what this looks like. So I can hit run and put in all of my values here and see if this actually works. So let's do this together where I'm going to put in hi, uh, customer name is Daniel, customer email is Daniel at voiceflow.com. My body is going to be, this is a test and subject is test. Finally, let's put our uh, example API key. So this is just a dummy one, but let's hit execute. And you can see here that it resolved the path as success. So it was successful. The output output variable is the ID that I grabbed. So it's the ticket ID. And if I open up the traces here, I can see what actually happens within the, the trace that's returned basically. So it's text and the text says ticket successfully created with ID 8271. So if you have a debug message, so let's say for example, I'm going to reuse the last values here, but for the Zendesk API key, I'm just gonna put in like, I don't know, something wrong. So this one, it's obviously gonna give like a 401 error or something because the Zendesk API key doesn't work, but let's see what this looks like. Great, so you can see it hit one of my error paths because I've got all the error there. And it says in traces, it's got debug error HTTP error status 401, which typically means that there's an authorization error. And so you can use these to keep going through all of these different checks to make sure that, you know, you're handling all the different errors. And this is how you would use the equivalent of like a console log is you do the return function and just use a trace type debug to actually show that message. One of the things I like to do when I'm testing out a new function that I've created is actually just put in all the variables here and just kind of test it out quickly. So if I say let, and what I can do then is I can just go ahead and just paste in my different variables here. And that way I can just run this test without needing to do this every time. It's a bit faster sometimes and might help speed it up, but you can just test out all of your different error handling cases that way as well. Now let's go through the exercise of actually modifying this and adding some stuff to it to give you a real sense of what it looks like if I'm trying to add something in VoiceFlow. So one of the features that I want to add to this function, I'm going to turn it into a create Zendesk ticket function uh, for the template page, is that um, getting a Zendesk API key is actually super annoying because it's not just the API key, you actually have a, to have like a base encoded, base 64 encoded version of this username slash token. So I don't expect a user to be able to go all through all that. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get the username and the API token as input variables. And then I'm going to create a function to base 64 encoded so the user doesn't have to. Now I'm going to create a new input variable called Zendesk email. And this is the company email associated with the Zendesk API key. I've also got my end Zendesk API key here. So API key from Zendesk. And another thing I want is that I probably want to actually turn this into a variable called company since it's going to be pretty dynamic. So let's just go ahead and change this. And we are going to inject the company variable in here. And so I actually need to get this variable company from somewhere. So I'll call this maybe Zendesk domain, the subdomain name of the company or Zendesk subdomain. And I'll give them a little example, which is company dot Zendesk. So I've got Zendesk domain here. I want to add it to, of course, up here. And I need to add the Zendesk email as well. So we've got a ton of input variables here that I'm going to be handling. And instead of company, we'll do Zendesk domain. Great. So now this should work. So I've got Zendesk email, Zendesk domain. To make this a bit cleaner, let's just get rid of priority. And so we should be good. But this means I need to have some additional variables here. So let's just add in some more required variables. So I need a Zendesk domain and email. And let's great. So it looks like I've got the two new um, items I've added here. And these are all being checked for. So now I need to get the actual Zendesk API key because this isn't what we're going to do. So what I want is I want to create a function that is able to actually like base 64 encode. Now, 
One of the really annoying things about functions, and I'll be completely honest, is that it doesn't support external libraries today. This is something that we're going to be supporting a, bit, a little bit later in the future, and it's definitely on the roadmap. Um, it also does support some basic functions that you would use with browser-based applications or in Node.js environments like Base64. So we're gonna have to manually create a Base64 function. Again, these are all on the roadmap, but just for the first version, we're gonna have to create this ourselves. Now, I do notice that in the 11 labs function that Nico has built, he's actually got a function here that converts something to base64. So rather than rewrite the wheel here, I'm going to copy this over and we're going to add this to our Zendesk demo here. And so now we've got a function that is able to create a base64. So let's just, okay. So I've got my function here called to base64 and then input base. And so now I'm going to just convert the actual API key into, so now we've got the function. So let's actually convert the items we have here. So the Zendesk email and the Zendesk API key into a base64 key. So we can create a variable called base. And we are going to use a function here. So to base64. And now let's create this string. So it's a pretty weird uh, thing, but we've got the email, so username. So in this case, it would be, and we need a, it's a slash token, slash token, and then we've got the API. That's API. Okay, so this should work now, and we've got our base64 key, and then we'll just replace this authorization with our base64. Uh, and so let's see if this works now. I've got, so we're going to run the domain is going to be a voice flow. The Zendesk email is going to be test at voiceflow.com. The customer name, let's say Daniel voice flow. Now for the Zendesk API key, I'm actually going to use the API key I got from Zendesk itself. So the non base 64 encoded version, again, this is just a dummy key, but I'll put this in here and the body is going to be test subject is going to be test. Let's see if this works. And great, cool. So it was successful, but I think one of the things that's helpful here to be able to do is let's say that I actually wanted to test this out to make sure that it was getting base 64 encoded correctly, or if it was for throwing a 401, uh, I can go ahead and, and in my overall kind of uh, error uh, over here, uh, I can just hit plus and then hit my base 64 key that I'm injecting. Just going to let me see if this is what I actually expect. So if I did this again now, but instead of the right email, so I put like a different email, for example, let's do like test 42, and then we'll fill the rest of this out. Just sample data. Maybe it's send us API keys here. You can see that here in the traces, because I've added the variable, I've got HTTP error status 401. And then I can see that I've got my base 64 encoded string here. And what's good is that it, it looks like it actually did work. So it was able to actually return the base64 encoded string. But that's how you would do it is you just figure out where in your flow you want to put your errors and then actually include the messages or the variables within there that you want to be able to render. So I hope that made sense. And this template should be able to get you up and started quicker. Now, one of the things I'd recommend is just checking through the functions documentation. Again, because this is a V0 launch, there are a lot of limitations with it. But we want to be able to get your feedback and we'll be adding a lot of the base functionality like external libraries and uh, functions like base 64 and a whole bunch of other ones so you don't have to go ahead and create workarounds but in the meanwhile just remember that if you're mapping the json responses don't use the parentheses and then just check the documentation for any other quirks when it comes to the syntax but we'll be improving this over time once again thank you for watching this video and let me know in the comments how we can improve functions what your experience has been and what you think are good functions that you might be able to build with this if you need any help, you can check out our developer Discord. You can find Discord in the VoiceSoul app. Once again, my name is Daniel. If you found this valuable, hit subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.